By definition, an artifact is an object that was made by human hands and holds some kind of cultural significance. It might tell us more about the people who came before us or hold some kind of historical interest. The problem with that definition is that we sometimes come across artifacts that are difficult to explain. It's a problem that every archaeologist and scientist knows, and one that you're about to get to know better by watching this video. When did our early ancestors first begin to make and use stone tools? That's a question we haven't got to the bottom of yet, but we might be inching closer. In July 2020, archaeologists in Mexico confirmed the discovery of a whole 1,900 stone artifacts inside Chiquihuite Cave in the Astillero Mountains region of the country. Within that enormous collection are a large set of stone tools that were made 30,000 years ago. Based on what we think we know about history, that ought to be impossible. The established historical narrative of the Americas is that the first human inhabitants of the land were the Clovis people, but they didn't appear until 15,000 years after these tools were made. The cave was most likely used either as a seasonal shelter or as a hunting base. The problem is that we don't have any idea who the people taking shelter or basing their hunting operations here were. The difficult conclusion that scientists have to face is that they're wrong about the Clovis people being the first humans to walk on this land, and they can't tell us who made these tools, where they came from, or where they went. When children are bored or in need of entertainment, they turn to toys. The modern toy business is a multi-billion dollar industry, but the practice of making toys is as old as time. As an example of just how ancient it is, here's a leather toy mouse that was found inside the remains of the ancient Roman fort of Vindolanda, close to Hadrian's Wall in England. Archaeologists believe it to be around 1,900 years old. This old scrap of leather is only five inches long and an inch wide but it's so detailed that it even has markings across its body to indicate fur. Are we jumping the gun by identifying it as a child's toy, though? Perhaps we are. The artifact was found within the commanding officer's residence inside the fort. That suggests that either the commanding officer of a Roman garrison liked to play with toy mice, or he had his family and children with him inside a military compound. Some historians think that rather than being a toy, it may have been a practical joke made by bored soldiers to scare their colleagues with. After all the things they'd seen, would Roman soldiers really be afraid of mice? Where do you think the largest pyramid in the world is? Would you say it's the Great Pyramid of Giza? Most people would agree with that idea, but it's wrong. The largest pyramid in the world is, in fact, in Mexico, and most of it is hidden inside a mountain. The locals call it Tlachihualtepetl, which in the Nahuatl tongue means mountain made by hand, but its westernized name is the Pyramid of Cholula. It's not only the world's largest pyramid, but the largest human-made monument of any kind anywhere on the planet. Its volume of over 13 million cubic feet makes it almost twice the size of the more famous pyramid in Egypt. Perhaps the reason it gets less attention is that while being wider, it's significantly shorter. It looks even shorter than it really is because most of it is buried under the soil. That's thought to have been a deliberate act by the natives in an attempt to protect it from rampaging Spanish conquistadors. With so much of its true history lost, its origins are wrapped up in myths and legends. Some even say that it was hand-built by Jehua, one of the seven giants of Aztec mythology. Warangal Fort in Telangana, India is already an ancient and mystical place, but the mystique of the location pales in comparison to the riddle of the Lingam inside it. While the rest of Warangal Fort is weathered by time and semi-ruined in places, the black basalt cylinder at its center still looks as pristine as it did on the day it was made. The difference between the artifact and the structures around it is so great 
that it almost looks out of place, as if someone left it there by accident. It's not just the Lingram's good looks that puzzle scientists. It's also the total absence of any marks left on the surface during the construction process. There isn't a single scratch or scuff made by a tool anywhere on the perfectly rounded object, which leaves scientists scratching their heads about how it could possibly have been made using only the tools available to people hundreds of years ago. We can't even make a perfectly rounded clay artifact today without the use of a rotating mechanism of some kind, but these ancient Indians somehow managed to make one out of solid black basalt without the use of any specialist equipment at all. Perhaps we'd understand the secret of the Lingram if we could make sense of the symbol etched into it. But unfortunately, nobody has been able to do that so far. Discovering the secrets of history is usually only possible if the evidence isn't tampered with. In the case of the Man Mound in Barabu, Wisconsin, USA, someone carelessly carved a road straight through its lower half. The huge earthen figure was badly damaged and compromised in the process, so now we'll probably never be able to answer all the questions we have about it. All we're left with are guesses. The most likely of those guesses to be correct is the suggestion that the Man Mound was made by an ancient culture known as the Mound Builders, but that tells us almost nothing. The reason they're called Mound Builders is the fact that they built earthenware mounds is pretty much the only thing we know about them. The earthenware construction is thought to be around 1,000 years old. Archaeologists in the USA usually turn to Native Americans when they want to know the true history of something like this. But in the case of the Man Mound, even the local tribes have no information. They believe it's been there for longer than their people. The Man Mound is a registered American national landmark, but there can't be many such registered landmarks that are as anonymous and unexplained as this one. For many generations, we were told that Christopher Columbus was the first European to visit the Americas. Even now, he's often referred to as the man who discovered the continent, but we know that isn't the case. There are dozens of holes in that claim when it comes to people beating Columbus to the punch, but perhaps none so enigmatic as this. In February 2020, a collection of tiny glass Italian beads was discovered in Alaska. Thanks to the presence of twine binding wrapped around them, it was possible to carbon date them to the early 1440s. That's a full 50 years before Columbus got lost and ended up finding the new world by accident. Historians think that the presence of the beads might indicate that the Silk Road trade route extended even further than we've always imagined. The beads likely came from Italy to China along the Silk Road, then up into Siberia, and then finally across the Bering Strait into Alaska. The gap between the two at the extreme east of Siberia and the extreme west of Alaska is small enough to be navigated by kayak, so it's foolish to think that nobody would have made the crossing in ancient times. The new question is how much further back in time might trade links between Europe and the original Americans go? Why did the ancient Cuchuteni Tripilian culture burn all of their settlements to the ground when they moved out? We wish we knew the answer, but they certainly made a habit out of it. They first appeared in Romania approximately 7,500 years ago, and spread out across Moldova and Ukraine before disappearing around 2,700 years later. Not only did they burn their settlements when they moved out, but they may even have had a schedule for doing so. Each Cuchuteni Tripilian settlement that's been discovered so far by archaeologists was active for between 60 and 80 years before being abandoned and torched. That leaves almost nothing behind in terms of archaeological evidence, and so it makes it almost impossible for modern-day historians to get to know them. It's entirely possible that the secretive people were absorbed into a different European civilization, but without any clues left behind for us to work on, we'll never be able to say for sure. In fact, if we didn't know better, 
we'd say that they deliberately erased themselves from the timeline. The consistent cycle of building and destruction probably had some reasoning behind it, but those reasons are unknown. Who were Yahweh and Asherah? And why do their names appear on so many of the artifacts that were found at Kuntilet Arjud in the Sinai Desert during the 1970s? That mystery has endured for half a century, and it doesn't seem like we're getting any closer to finding an answer. The most obvious explanation is that these inscriptions are references to the biblical figures of the same name, but the placement of the inscriptions makes experts question that idea. The same two words repeatedly appear on ceramic pithos, but are also found next to representations of animals, gods, and human figures. To make matters worse, the words are often surrounded by other inscriptions that can't be translated. Although the style of the language and the lettering appears to be Hebrew, it seems to blend with Phoenician, and so the result is incoherent. The word Asherah is interpreted by some to be the name of the wife of God, but other scholars say it should be understood as having a similar meaning to the word sacred. It may even be possible that the Yahweh and Asherah inscriptions were added as a form of graffiti long after the original artifacts were made. Maybe it's the world's earliest brand name. We all know someone who thinks they're the center of the world. We know an artifact that was once believed to share that quality. It's called the Omphalos of Delphi, and many centuries ago, it stood in the middle of Delphi as a marker of the place the ancient Greeks believed to be the middle of the world. Naturally, it never occurred to them that the center of the world might be outside their country. Greek myths and legends say that Zeus threw the Omphalos into the air to determine where the middle of the world was and then allowed it to stay in place when it landed. That explains its name, which translates into English as the Earth's navel. The artifact is now in the Delphi Archaeological Museum, but what's odd about it is that the museum's owners aren't sure whether this is the original stone or a replica made at a much later time. If it's the former, then it's the same stone that Greek writer Pausanias saw and recorded during his travels in the second century. Back then, it was covered in a woolen cloth and had an adornment on top with two gold gilded eagles. The decorations are long gone, but it's possible that this artifact and the stone that Pausanias saw are one and the same. You know that archaeologists and scientists are stumped when they know so little about an artifact that they can't even come up with an appropriate name for it. This is the Lake Winnipesaukee Mystery Stone. As you've no doubt guessed already, it's named for the fact that it was found close to Lake Winnipesaukee, and its true nature is a complete mystery. The black egg-shaped rock was found in 1872 during the erection of a new fence post in Concord, New Hampshire, USA. The unusual looking artifact is polished to a shine, four inches tall, and has a smooth hole running all the way through its center. There's been speculation that the enigmatic symbols carved onto its side are astrological or astronomical, although nobody seems to know their precise meaning if that's the case. Archaeologists have never offered a theory as to its location or purpose, and even at the time of its discovery, there were suspicions that it was a forgery. What would be the point, though? And why would humble 19th century farm workers be interested in creating a fake artifact? Until someone's prepared to take the object seriously and do a little research, it remains classified as a mystery. You might not think there's a great deal of mystery about the Waffle Rock in West Virginia, USA. It's a rock, and it looks like a waffle. Mystery solved, right? Actually, wrong! The name of this odd rock only tells us what it looks like. It tells us nothing about how it came to look like that in the first place. The geometric pattern of straight lines intersecting and crisscrossing at regular intervals must surely be the product of human engineering. Scientists don't agree, though. 
They say that this distinctive pattern is down to natural erosion and nothing else. The U.S. Corps of Engineers has studied the Waffle Rock extensively, and they say that it's made from a sandstone rock that started to form 300 million years ago as nothing more than a plain, normal chunk of sandstone. A tectonic plate shift then cracked and broke it, which allowed iron oxide to penetrate into the cracks and make the distinctive lattice patterns we see today. That sounds semi-convincing. But would such a random process really result in such perfect shapes? Not everyone agrees. If you'd like to see it with your own eyes and make up your own mind, you'll find a large piece of it on permanent display by the side of Jennings Randolph Lake. For reasons best known to themselves, the global aristocracy has always been interested in decorative eggs. These days, it's Fabergé eggs, but 5,000 years ago, it was delicately painted ostrich eggs. Despite their fragile nature, they've been found in tombs and other archaeological sites all over the world. The question that's always bothered archaeologists is how the eggs got to such far-flung places when there are only a few places on the planet they could conceivably have come from. Some of the best preserved examples of the eggs can be found in the collection of the British Museum where they've been studied closely in recent years. In April 2020, the results of the most detailed study in the history of the ovoid artifacts were published. They found that all of the eggs came from either the Eastern Mediterranean or North Africa. For them to have reached the Far East and Western Europe, there must have been a colossal trade network stretching across the land even back then, long before the Silk Road. The people working on this trade route must also have understood how to safely dry, prepare, and store these eggs for transport across huge distances. Finding out where the eggs came from has only given us a bigger mystery to solve. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!